one is inside the house. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We call this uh, committee of the whole for March 25th uh, to order. Uh, we'll turn it over to uh, our city manager, Keith Rogers. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, this afternoon, I am honored to introduce uh, Mr. Mitchell Silver uh, with McAdams Company. Uh, Mr. Silver is uh, somewhat of a, uh, if I may say, a celebrity. Uh, he is a uh, very experienced uh, and renowned urban planner. Uh, he also served as planning director for the city of Raleigh, but also the commissioner for New York City's uh, Parks Department. And so uh, he has joined us this afternoon to talk about uh, the benefits of making a plan of doing comprehensive land use planning and developing a blueprint for growth. Uh, so we will ask Mr. Silver to come and, and join us this afternoon. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good Mayor, afternoon. City Council, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm joined by my colleague, Eliza Monroe. We had a wonderful lunch at the Rocky Mills, and so um, looking at the time, it was so good. We said, oh, it's time to go. So we had a great time there, uh, so certainly want to come back. Uh, so uh, I am, as was stated by Mr. Rogers, a planner for close to 40 years, served as president of the American Planning Association, as was stated. Uh, I was head of planning uh, in Raleigh for about 10 years, and during the time, we embarked on a blueprint for growth uh, and really helped set forward uh, what the city really looks like today. So I want to share with you, hopefully get you excited uh, about what to anticipate so that you're embarking on the same challenge. And so the presentation's about 30 minutes. I can slow it down, speed it up. I'll go through some parts uh, very quickly, but I do definitely want to get to some of your questions. I uh, always like to start off by sharing what is happening here across the country on some of the top real estate markets. Uh, Raleigh traditionally is on that list uh, year after year. Uh, you're within the same region, so it's important to know as people look for growing markets, these are the top 10 and generally it stays about the same. And so we look at that to understand the growth pressures because people have choices to move and they're certainly choosing North Carolina as one of those destinations. And we look at the past couple of years about the migration trends. Why are people moving? Uh, number one, they're looking for quality of life. People are loving the outdoor experiences. And even now, there's a continuation of remote at work. People got used to working at home during COVID, lower tax liability. And if you look at the top five inbound states, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arizona, and Florida. Florida surpassed Idaho because the Californians are getting tired of moving to Idaho. They're coming to the Carolinas. And then really the flexibility of remote work in early retirement. So those were 2022 trends. Last year trends, uh, they started seeing a decrease in move volume. Once again, North Carolina is one of those top five states. And now the COVID restrictions, which was a factor in 2022, is no longer a factor now. And people now are looking to take advantage of hybrid remote remote work options and looking to move either to the suburbs to the south. So this is desire and the question is how can Rocky Mount capture this energy because we looked at your growth trends and right now you're basically either decreasing or remaining flat. How do you get this momentum of that new tax base, new businesses that will move here into this city? We always like to share emerging challenges and trends. You have a consultant that will be doing this work. You want to watch these trends and challenges. It's different for every place. You want to understand, you're not just looking for a vision of the future, but what problems are you solving? What are the trends and challenges? So these are global, or at least you say national ones, but specifically, what are some of the trends right here uh, in Rocky Mount? But these are some of the top ones that almost every place is experiencing. But here's what had happened for you the last 10 years. Uh, you're seeing a, which is unique in North Carolina, not to eastern part of North Carolina, but you're seeing this drop uh, from basically from 2000, well, really from 2010 to 2020, you saw this huge drop in population. Uh, and as I stated, what things people are looking for is a quality of life and taxes and jobs and outdoor amenities, housing affordability, schools, access to jobs and good services. You know, the process is going to have to find out you know, what happened. What's happening in Rocky Mountain? We've got to dig a little bit deeper to understand exactly what is happening with the population loss. Now you've kind of flattened out, but you certainly have room to grow. And the question is exactly how do we guide that planning process going forward? 
So the question is, and this is something I'm sure the consultants will answer, is why is Rocky Mountain losing population? And so you understand how growth, both shrinkage and growth work, is that population is gained by in-migration, that's new residents moving in, an increase in household size, marriage, birth, adoption, caring for someone, new tenant or roommate, and then population is lost by people leaving, out-migration. Uh, and then decrease in household size, death, family, some are leaving the school, the army, divorce. The question is, what's happening is that this population loss, what's happening here, is outweighing the population increase, which gives you a net decrease. So we have to understand what is happening with that population loss to see we can address some of those trends. And so during the conference and planning process, we hope we'll get more insight to give you the guidance and direction about how you can start reversing that trend to have people staying or moving versus leaving. We looked at some of the top, the largest employers in Rocky Mount. Uh, no surprise, you probably all know fires from the top of the list. You have a lot of public sector entities, but they're also important to be a partner on making this a quality community so you can see exactly, and I just had to look up some of them to see who they were, but you have great partners to start this planning process. Not just residents, you want to make sure you have the business community and partners to make sure you continue to make this a thriving community to live in. So I'm going to touch on these very quickly. These are 10 critical elements I think you need to pay attention to. Once again, you're starting a process, and so the consultant may take a different take, but I'll go through these very quickly. Uh, the one, this is happening globally, the Brownie and Graying of America. They call it Silver Tsunami. They didn't name it after me, but that's one trend. The change in households. You'd be surprised you're seeing a growth in what we call single person or sole person households. Uh, and then also millennials are now looking for homes. No one thought that would happen. The millennials loved urban living, and now you see them moving across the country to second tier cities, uh, and so that is a huge, huge change. So overall, uh, more Americans are living longer. Uh, the population is more diverse and multicultural. Uh, Immigration is a trend that's most likely to continue. Uh, and then as I said, by 2030, majority of households in America will be one person. Not a family, one person. A lot of people aren't ready for that change of what does it mean, and then by 2045, there'll be no race over 50% of the overall population. In terms of the growing of the country, by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. And if you look at how long they're going to live, uh, by 1993 to, tw to, eight, uh, to 2050, life expectancy will increase from 76 years to 82.6 years, which means the number of Americans over 85 in the U.S. are going to triple from 5.4 to 19 million. One of the implications on average is about 600,000 people over the age of 70 stop driving each year. So the question is, what are those mobility options? How will people get around? I don't think there's enough Ubers or paratransit is going to find a new life. But these are the implications we have to understand of an aging population. I also like to talk about the different generations. There are generally six generations at any given time. The greatest generation, uh, bless their souls, uh, most likely there aren't many of them left. They're 97 years and older. They, went, uh, they lived through the Great Depression, World War II, uh, but that was a very powerful generation which we call the greatest and then you see all the different generations. The reason why I say this is when you do a planning process, we kind of generalize to different populations. They have different expectations for what they expect in the city, in a community, in a region. And so we have to make sure in the planning process, we touch all those different groups, not just one, but all of them. This is a demographic profile of Rocky Mount. We have Nash County, Edgecombe, North Carolina, and then Raleigh, which is a bit of a younger city. And you can see the people under 55 in Rocky Mount is two thirds of your population. Yet very often in public meetings, you get the reverse. You get the majority of people over 55. You want to make sure it's balanced. The same thing for Nash County. If you compare it to Raleigh, 78% of the population is under 55. So they're more tolerant of change, looking to be more innovative. And so this is an important chart. I highlighted the yellow because that's the Gen Z population. They're from 6 to basically 25. You want to keep them. This is your future labor force. 
these are the people that you want to stay, and the worst thing you can do is they go off to college and said, I'm not coming back to Rocky Mountain. You want to keep them. You want to keep their energy. They make places vibrant. Yes, you want the wise individuals who are stable citizens, but you also want to have that labor force to make sure your city is moving forward. And so as I stated, all those different generations have future needs, desires, and aspirations, and they're different. And we need to have conversations to understand all of them. And so it's not just about what's next, it's about who's next, and we want to make sure we engage all of our citizens. So that's on demographics. Healthy living. The 55 plus, they're looking to retire, and they're moving all over the country. But for them, they want to stay active. As I stated, they're living longer, but they want places they can walk and bike have access to greenways, trails, and sidewalks, and then this whole craze about pickleball, yes, look there, look, look how serious that man is. I mean, pickleball has become a craze across this country, uh, but this is not an uncommon scene in many places around the country. With a 55 plus, they have money, they're looking to retire, and are looking for quality places they can move to, and we want Rocky Mount to be one of them. And let's look at the joy in this man's face being on a greenway. This is what this age group is expecting, access to greenways, to parks, so they can be excited as they age gracefully in their community. I can just go on and on. The other important one is regionalism. Rocky Mount is too small to compete on its own. You have to compete as a region. You have to understand the value of regionalism, Nash County, Edge County. You have to compete as a region like the Triangle, like Wilmington. All these places compete as a region, not just the city itself, so that you can offer more to a prospective company coming in. You want to make sure that you support regional assets, proximity to greenways. People aren't just buying um, a home, they're buying a place. They want to make sure they have access to all the amenities, so they say, this is a place that I want to, uh, want to live. And I have this saying that you rise as a region or you fall as a region. Each part of the region has to support each other to make you competitive. And so I'll never forget when I was in Raleigh, we did this ULI exercise about our growth, and it was a whole triangle. It was Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and we had to talk about how we were going to grow as a region. And so in the end, we decided to go with our transit connections, vibrant centers, and green spaces because we had to figure out how we're going to handle all this growth coming in, and that's the plan that eventually went forward. And so I challenge you, as you look at Rocky Mount and the surrounding region, uh, I'm hoping the consultants will find out what is that regional approach to make you as a region competitive. They may have a business here in Rocky Mount and live somewhere in Nash County, or they may live in Nash County and want to have a business right here uh, or, or live in, in Rocky Mount. We have to look at those regional connections uh, in order for you to grow. Blueprint for growth, and I really would like you all to pay attention because I believe this is what this is all about. Places that plan do way better than places that don't. Uh, number one, the role of planning is to manage growth and change and uncertainty about the future. I'll never forget when I was in Raleigh, the businesses would come to me and say, can you tell us what is your plan for your city? And after we met with all these major companies, say, I want to move here. You have a plan. I know exactly what's happening, where the businesses are going to go, where people are going to live, and they really like that. In fact, I have this saying that you could either be a plan-making place that follows a plan or a deal-making place, that everything is transactional. Now, people say, well, deals aren't bad, but for developers and others, it's unpredictable. If I say, what can I put here, I don't know. It's up to the deal. And places that have a plan know exactly what's coming, and so that's something I would certainly advocate. And so the purpose of a plan is to have a blueprint for growth, be clear about the problems you're solving, set the vision and framework, understand the value of land, which I'll get to, preserve your authentic places. I think why Rocky Mills is so unique is that it's authentic. I've seen nothing like that in this region. It's unique. And then you want to focus on implementation. When I was in Raleigh, our challenge was that we had a small town identity. I called it going from Mayberry to Metro. A lot of people didn't like that. In our case, we're growing 12 to 15,000 people per year. We knew we would run out of land in 20 years. For us, for all, it was fiscally irresponsible. So it wasn't about a vision for the future, but what problems do you want to solve? That's the purpose of doing this plan. What problem do we want to solve to make sure we have a blueprint of how we're going to grow into the future? And so for us, we zoomed in on being a 21st century city. We had a lecture series that got people excited 
People were driving as far as Wilmington and Greensboro to go to these conferences to have a conversation about how do we design a 21st century city? How do we create a pedestrian friendly city? We posed every lecture as a question, and as you can see, it was a performing arts center, it was packed each and every time. People were hungry for a plan for how our region was going to grow. Uh, we engaged the Gen uh, Millennials, and we started having the Big Ideas competition to really think big about the city. We even had Kid City, uh, where we got the kids to build a box. What was so cute, we had floors taped with blocks and lots. The kid had to actually apply for a permit to put their box on a lot. And we told them, I'm sorry, it's denied, it's a non-conforming use. The mother looked at us, why are you being so mean to my kid? I said, there's a board of appeals. The table next door, uh, just to make sure that they got involved. But the kids were getting involved because it was their city, their future as well. And then who knew, the News and Observer did entire Sunday supplement back then when the News and Observer was bigger on what should Raleigh look like in 2030. The entire city was talking about it. They were excited about what the future was unfolding for the city of Raleigh. And so I was shocked and proud. And you're seeing Fayetteville Street back in, our, uh, in the early 1900s, 1928. And so in the end, working with the community, we came up with these six themes economic prosperity and equity, expanding housing choices, and this plan's about to be redone now, but this has served Raleigh for well over a decade, and it really helped shape the development of the city that you see today. So in the end, this was our blueprint. This was it. To handle all that growth, we came up with eight growth centers and 12 multimodal corridors. And we said 60 to 70% of all growth is going to happen in those darker areas. Everything else, don't worry about it. The city will remain the same. And in fact, when you start to dive into some of those places, we actually did what the plan said we were going to do. Not through a deal, but through a plan, although some deals had to happen. So North Hills, Downtown South, and all these other areas, this became the blueprint so people knew how we were going to grow. We also want to be clear about how you implement a comp plan. It's not just a pretty document. We had policy guidance and actions for city council and plan commission. We had a development code. A plan is policy, but a code are the rules. And then we had capital projects. It was all laid out so people knew exactly what was going to happen where for the next 20 years. Very, very predictable. The other thing that I have to highlight with you is that people are looking for walkable communities, walkable places. And I'm not saying every place in the entire city should be walkable, but they love these notes. They can get out, outside ball, walk and enjoy themselves. And so these traditional neighborhood development, walkable, close proximity, human scale, range of housing, preserving open space. Uh, some examples at different scales. Uh, this is one that now you're seeing more subdivisions with sidewalks on both sides. When I became plan director, it was only sidewalk on one side. If you didn't have a sidewalk, good luck for you walking the street. But now you're seeing more and more subdivisions having sidewalks on both sides. You now see parking in the rear to enhance that curb appeal and that walkability. Uh, this is in Woodstock, Georgia, similar technique, a little bit higher density. One of the few places I've seen where a railroad track, like you have, through the center of their town became an asset and actually stunning. They're one of the few places that actually pulled it off, and that's in Woodstock, Georgia. Uh, here's a more extreme example in Charlotte, but it shows how density and the activity and the people they want to be outside. They want to have those experiences. And then the next point is planning and placemaking or reimagining the public realm. You want to create an experience. You want your place to be authentic and memorable. And there's something called the power of 10. Every city should have 10 destinations with 10 things to do in each destination. That's aspirational. So as we look at Rocky Mount, how do we help that happen here in the city? And we want to make sure it is people centered. I also believe that people may eat and sleep in their homes or apartments, but they live in public space. That's where the excitement and all the activity occurs. And so while older generations like me, we're consumers of goods, we love buying stuff, but the younger generations, they're consumers of experiences. They want experiences. That's why Rocky, the, the, the mills were so popular. And when I walked downtown, we didn't see as many people, but we shouldn't just be designers and planners, but experience builders. How do we build an experience? in Rocky Mount to get people to come here again and again and again. So getting back to the blueprint for growth, I'll show you what we're able to do. So this was a blueprint, and then we got to work. 
Glenwood South, our entertainment district, City Market, our downtown historic area, Moore Square, our Central Park, Midtown, North Hills, if you've been there, now it's the, basically another downtown. All this was intentional, based on the plan. And we went to work, we changed the zoning, we made sure, we didn't just incentivize it, but our code says you can do this there. And it absolutely worked. We were able to transform Moore Square. Uh, that is now a major destination in our downtown. Uh, this is around uh, Glenwood South, uh, Smoky Hollow, a very active place right now. Uh, this is downtown south, one of my visions to extend downtown further south. We're trying to get a soccer stadium, but right now this one is being entitled and the infrastructure is going in place. You see downtown in the back. Our downtown couldn't hold all the development, so we said let's go south, all because of the plan. This is the Innovation District, part of North Hills, now extending toward the Falls of Noose. Again, all of this was planned as part of that blueprint for growth. And so I looked at your couple of websites to find one of the five most popular attractions here. Your Children's Museum, the Tar River Trail, Rocky Mount Mills, Battle Park, and Rocky Mount City Lake and Park. We want you to increase these. There needs to be more. We said 10, you have five. We want to make sure you have more of these to make this, quote unquote, uh, the power of 10. Here are some examples. Uh, this is beautiful. We we'll want to dissolve within your community. This is where we were today. What an amazing amenity. To have something where I could, I'm a runner, to run or bike and see that as I'm approaching it is just absolutely stunning and unique. As I mentioned, people looking for those outdoor social gathering places. This is all the private sector, not city or county spending money on parks. And you see this trend again and again, where parks and public spaces become these sanctuaries of sanity where it has now the power to heal and bring joy. And so this is the box yard, the Triangle Park, that took some containers. And now this is a popular destination. I don't know if you can see it, but they stack these containers and they call it box yard. Very popular. Uh, this is in one of the uh, nearby, uh, I'm not sure this is Fenton, but you put a little bit of green space. This is private. All of a sudden you have this amazing place. This can be put into your code to make sure you can expect more of it. And you can see this replicated again and again and again by having a plan, code tool, and then working on implementation to make these things happen. Uh, they talk about strategic investments in parks can spur, spur your economic vitality. I co-wrote this article with a friend of mine, Carol Coletta, to see how parks are starting to change what you are doing. Cary just completed an amazing downtown park. It is just, fun you've been there? Yes, sir. It is the most beautiful park I've seen in North Carolina, hands down. It is now changing the entire area around it. A park. What a major destination. So this is an amazing. Uh, I worked on a plan to uh, redo Hillsborough Street with six roundabouts, uh, and we took some traffic lanes out, and now you see all the development along Hillsborough Street finally next to NC State emerging. Uh, alleys. This is uh, something very popular in Australia. It's now coming to the U.S. This is in Wilmington. All these backdoor spaces, these cool experiences. Not to buy it. Just reimagine what you have back there. And you have these intimate spaces that young people and others will just enjoy. Here's another example of another alleyway. Now it becomes an outdoor art gallery. Simple tweaks that could actually take advantage of what you do. I'm coming to the close. This is about housing affordability. I don't think it's an issue for you per se, but that's something I want to talk more about. But you certainly want to uh, make sure you have affordable housing and attainable housing, which is a new term people are starting to use. In our code, it was a big issue, so we gave people a flavor of what we look for. Uh, we went with a context-based code. Uh, and so here's other examples with fringe requirements. Uh, we came up with a technique of a cottage court, compact more units, and a very walkable place with a parking in the rear. Uh, accessory dwelling units. Uh, this is where you can have a unit in the back. Uh, if you're aging out, you want to move in this unit, rent out your house so you can stay there for the rest of your life, you can do that. But to provide more of those housing options, and then a new term, which we can talk more about, the missing middle, which is between detached home and low mid-rise apartment, everything in between. Those are some new options that people are putting into practice these days. And there's one of the missing mills. You can't tell if it's single family or it's rental. This one's a rental. There are apartments in there, not single family homes. And it looks just the same. 
When we get to it, we can talk about all the affordable housing options. There are many, but this is what you can have at your disposal. If this is something that you desire here in this community, if people are concerned about attainable or affordable housing. We're getting close to the end. This one's a value of land, and I encourage all of you to pay attention because you, as part of the city council, you have a boundary with a fixed amount of land, and you control the value of that land by how you zone. Land is it's a finite resource, and from it, you generate property tax and sales tax. <clears throat> and the planning policy and zoning you put on it will affect its value. Just that simple. And you'll see in a second that we have to be smarter about how we create the value of land on this property. Let me give an example when I was in Raleigh because they were all upset about all oh, this development downtown, what are you doing? So I had to communicate. It would take 600 single family homes on 150 acres to equal the tax value of one of our high rises downtown. Now think about it, 150 acres versus one acre. And that's the Wachovia building if you've seen it. So this building has 90 times the tax value of a suburban acre. So by putting zoning, now you can't just put high density everywhere, but people began to realize if you really want to keep taxes low and stable, then you need to have some of this so that their property taxes can remain stable. And so that's something we want to look very carefully at, as well as that downtown high rise I just mentioned can pay off this infrastructure uh, basically in three years. And a return on investment is 35%. That suburban project would take 42 years to pay off this infrastructure with ROI of 2%. So these are decisions you make when you start looking at the value of land. And we took that growth framework back and we zoned it for those areas so that we can capture some of those taxes. So a friend of mine in Asheville came up with this great technique. We did this, laid it out, and someone says, well, what about a Walmart? Well, Walmart sits on 34 acres. That small six-story downtown building sits on a half acre, but it generates taxes. Yeah, Walmart does $6,500 a year, but that six-story building, 10 times the amount on less land. And if you look at, well, Walmart produces jobs. Yeah, on a per acre basis, six. That makes you six-story building, 74. So I want you to think, and some people say, we don't want this too tall, too high, but part of it is we're trying to help create a vibrant place, but also keep taxes low or stable. So we did the same thing in Raleigh, and no surprise, Walmart was $2,000 per acre annually. The six-story building in our downtown was 110. So we looked very carefully at how we're gonna do our plan. So we decided to do this two-dimensional map to see where the tax value was in Raleigh, but I couldn't really see downtown, so I told my staff, can you please put it in three dimensions, and can you tell me where the value of our tax base is coming from? Just look at that. I'm wondering how much of this is paying for the taxes to keep it low for the rest of the city. Just by picking the right locations, not across the city as you can see, but picking the right locations, it shows you very clearly this return on investment and how you need to zone places in the right place. We're pursuing transit and this growth framework map. That's the, tra that's the change you're gonna see as a result of the plan we put in place. And so Raleigh, yeah, it's an expensive place, but we're able not to see these huge spikes in taxes because we have this blueprint for growth that makes sure we're smarter about how we grow. And so when I look at all the parking lots and I look at the downtown, there are some opportunities for you to follow the same approach as you go through this planning process to have that blueprint for growth. And again, there's your railroad track, which is why I showed you Woodstock, Georgia, an amazing example to look at. Greenville, I know you're heading to, wow. What a phenomenal place that's done major transformation in South Carolina. I'll skip this one. This is more about just flooding risks. Uh, we do know you have water. You have to take that in consideration, heat. So these are some factors. This is your Pfizer plant. And so that is also a concern. And so uh, I'm gonna kind of close here. What I do wanna share with you is that more and more places that are by the waterfront are using their parks as flood protection. This is in Memphis, Tom Lee Park. They're by a river, you're by a river. Look at those edges to see exactly how you can transform these, not just for flood protection, but also for an amenity that people can enjoy and for economic development. 
So I believe that smart places know this sense of urgency 10 years before it's urgent. Rocky Mount, I know you're smart. All I can say is time for a plan, a blueprint for growth. I will stop now and see if you have any questions. Can I do that in 30 minutes? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Yes. I will. For your uh, five most popular attraction, um, you didn't put the event center. I pulled it off of a TripAdvisor. Um, so I just started here. So the more I'm here, I could add that to the list. So now you're up to six. And seven. We seven. have one of the largest. Did you get that down, Liza? Uh, MLK parts in North Carolina. We have another. And the historic Booger T. Washington High School with the first, I have, I have a dream speech from Dr. King in 1962, which is historic. So we're we'll moving up on the list. We just want to make sure that this comprehensive plan. Yes. You know, Rocky Mountain in two counties. And we want to make sure that we see growth on both sides of that track. If not, we're going to get off to a bad yeah. <laughs> start. I'm just saying that so that going into this, that you be aware yes. of what our is going to be. Yeah. So, uh, Council Member, for clarification purposes, I'm an advisor okay. uh, to the comprehensive plan. You, AECOM is going to be your consultant throughout the process. Based on my, my experience, I'll be working with the city manager to make sure as it proceeds, from my years of experience, how I can help be an asset to him. So I will not be, this was just to give you an excitement because I am so grateful. You all decided to proceed with a blueprint because okay. I've seen places that don't have a blueprint, right. do not compete and do not as do well as places that do. And so that's why we're taking it all down. You will have ACOM their team coming in that will do the entire process and make sure those 10 to 12 to 15 assets are well known to everyone. Okay. And if I would have known that in most of us, I probably wouldn't have said what I said. No, it's totally good. I'm cool. I'm, I'm from up north. We have resilient skin. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Thank you. I have questions. I, I don't disagree with anything that you stated. Um, your data proves out what our prior studies have proven, as well as our we had we had a formal plan. It just didn't sync with the um, the zoning and, and the you know. So I'm, I'm in agreement. With all of that. I really have more questions for the manager than I do for you. Okay. So I can wait until others have asked, and then I can. Uh, and, and and so you know. Yeah. Typically, you do a plan, a blueprint, and then you codify the rules. So it usually comes with a future land use map. I showed the blueprint because it was easier for the public to see. An average citizen does not know what a future land use map is. So we translated it to the growth framework map so they can see here are all the places that are going to urbanize. Here are all the new corridors, bus rapid transit, bike facilities, more walking. But the rest of the yellow stuff, y'all are fine. It's going to stay basically the same. And that helped them understand how uh, the city was going to grow. But we needed the rules, the code, to say this rule says you have to do this, you can't do that, and so it's always plan and then code. Okay, I'll Thank you. Uh, working with Raleigh, uh, as you as you stated, so they were intentional about their development, and uh, as we categorize the gentrification, um, but they were intentional about some of the displacement that they deal with today, or is that just a byproduct? Of their that, that, that is a deep question, uh, gentrification. I always take a pause uh, and ask someone, because I was there and predicted it was going to happen if we did not intervene. There's gentrification where, let me put it this way, knowing the neighborhood right next to downtown, we knew there would be growth pressures. Most of those homeowners were private homeowners. And so while people saw the end product, it was gentrified. In some cases, there was predatory practices that forced people out. 
But in other cases, people said, you're giving me my, this house is worth 60,000, you're gonna give me 300? Let's make a deal. So it was a little bit of both. I can't just say all of it was gentle. Some was self-imposed, others it was predatory. But you always want to make sure this is where the pressure is going to come from. Then you draw a circle about who is vulnerable. I believe, and I'm doing work in Texas, of an anti-displacement plan that would anticipate it coming and not wait for it to come when you're already too late. So in Raleigh, yes, there was gentrification. If you know East Raleigh, it happened, it's happening. But I had flagged it back in 2006, and I said, it's coming. And some people said, don't worry about it. We can take care of it. It happened. So if that is a concern, I would strongly recommend looking at anti-displacement plans. Uh, there are different techniques in different states. So that's something that the consultant could dig into more if that is an issue here. But yes, it did happen in Raleigh. There's no question about it. Thank you, but the anti-displacement plan would be yes. your advice. Yes. Okay. If you Google it, you know, UT Austin is the one that put one out, but they're specific to Texas. Mm -hmm. But they're out there, and they have different techniques about how you can address a good idol. See, to me, I always prefer to say displacement than gentrification, because gotcha. back in the day, gentrification was considered a good thing, mm -hmm. and then it got flipped and became a bad thing, but it's really displacement. If you're a homeowner, you're in a better position to control your destiny. If you're a renter, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. And thank you for the presentation, too. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Obviously, we have a lot of opportunities of him. One of the things in Raleigh or Charlotte or whatever, but we have got to look at how can we bring business downtown. Those businesses, hopefully that will bring about the different kinds of home ownership and, and, and clientele to work, etc. Magic wand, etc. But, you know, what, what do a lot of cities like us who are struggling and trying to rebirth their downtown? What are the, some of the key things that we need to look at as we begin this comprehensive? Well, one process. is you want to, well, I'll never forget the mayor of Oklahoma City lost, I think it was Boeing. He was upset, wanted to find out what happened. He went to them and he said that you didn't have a place. I didn't want to have people move here. I need the amenities. So believe it or not, it's creating a quality place. And it takes time to do that, but that's number one, a quality place. Number two, like you have the Rocky Mills, um, Rocky Mount Mills, okay. if you have a champion like that that's willing to invest in a master project, I think you want to find more. That, that's, that's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. You need to grow on that success. It can't just be contained within itself. You need to start seeing what's next to it so you start to build out of that amazing, successful place, whether it's a park or something else. I see the river. So to me, you look at your best assets and see how you can grow it. But you have to start with a quality place because, and then also education. Uh, what's unique about some places in North Carolina, we don't have to recruit talent, but you're close enough to the triangle that it's not a far drive. So I would try to see what kind of companies are interested, hear what they have to say about why they're not choosing Rocky Mountain. That comes from the economic development team, and that could be painful, but it's also educational to find out the reason why we chose this place and not Rocky Mount, so you know what are your disadvantages that you can start to make better. But typically, it's a quality place. You have the low taxes. Mm -hmm. You have a beautiful environment. You have the, I mean, you have all these amenities. There's something else that's missing, and that's what you have to focus on to make that a lot better. But where you do have success, all the places that council member mentioned, uh, as well as the Rocky Mount Mills, and you want to grow on that success, because to me, that's stunning. That's stunning. We're almost late because we were enjoying the atmosphere so much. And I'm looking at the water saying, is there a real trailway there? Is it going somewhere else? Right. So that's some of the reasons. That's some of the things you have to do. So as a follow-up, we are finalizing 300 acres of land west. And that's going to take a lot of planning and, and working uh, with various people to make sure that we plan for that future growth out there. Yes. But we cannot to get other areas all in Rocky Mount. 
You, you have to do both. And I think over time, you need relationships with master builders and developers, because you look downtown, nice public ground. You know, I, I didn't, I want to see where that main street is, the one with the yellow buildings. I got to take a look at that just to get a vibe. But we always start from those assets that are fantastic. Mm -hmm. North Hill started, you all remember Penny's? It was a, sure. a harp. <laughs> now he just did one project, now it keeps growing. Now he's going from Six Forks all the way to Falls of Noose. It just doesn't end, but started small. And grew. Same thing with the Village District. Mm -hmm. When I was there, you had what they called Cameron Village, now the Village District. I changed all the zoning around Cameron Village to say, guess what? You can go six stories. What? Well, guess what? You could walk across the street to the restaurants, to the shops. You don't have to drive. There was no additional traffic. And all these empty nesters loved it. I don't, can't tell you the pain I went through to allow zoning along Clark and Oberlin to go. That was me. I did that while I was there. It's like, we had the parking. We have the uses, let's just find shopping centers, which is another thing you can do. You find the existing shopping centers that were aging out, and you allow density right around the perimeter. All of a sudden, people have restaurants, shopping, I don't have to drive there, I just walk across the street, and they become these dynamic places. Now the village district is coming through a whole master plan because it's more car-oriented, they don't want to make it more people-oriented, building off the success that you have. Yes, sir. So thank you. I'm sorry I've been a bit late, but I uh, look at your plans. Uh, and looking at the north side of Rocky Mount, really looks great. But if you go back around Springfield Road and come back around, all the way back around to the north side, even to the Nashville Road, have anybody looked at that? That area. I have not. Uh, again, I'm here as an advisor, city manager, but we'll certainly make sure my colleague is running it down and we'll communicate it to the comp plan consultants. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your point. One of, one of the things that you mentioned earlier <clears throat> was regionalism, and I think that's one of the opportunities we have in Nash and Edgecombe County as well as Wilson and Halifax. And and I know in the Triangle, y'all have done such a great job, and it didn't happen overnight. Anything with the, you know, secret sauce there, so to speak, we, we know it's relationships. We understand that, and that's one thing we need to work work on. Yeah. On all sides. Yeah, I think it's invest like, look, with the RTP Foundation and RTP, I mean, that in 1959, it was started everything. It became a partnership between business, universities, and government, and it worked. They created this separate entity, but that engine fueled everything. But now with the regional, the MPO, uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, and with uh, the other um, Triangle COG, all the planners, we, we were meeting monthly. We could pair notes. And so if you're building this facility, well, we want them to live here. Good for you. We cheered for Durham. We cheered for Chapel Hill. And people in regional said, no, I have to get it all myself. No, the whole region benefits because if a huge plant opens up in Nash County, the outside of Rocky Mount, I want to live in Rocky Mount. So you all benefit. It's not I want it all. It's how do you share. So it does start with Triangle J. Every time we sat down, all the planning directors from the entire region would get together, share their plans, how we can help one another. But then we had the Chamber of Commerce uh, that would also support us. So you're right, it's gonna become a partnership, but there has to be an entity that says, we're in this together. We're gonna rise as a region, we're gonna fall as a region. And to me, that's what works. So we'll cheer. I mean, that Cary Park is unbelievable. We're cheering for Cary, I'm jealous. I would love to see that. Dick's Park look like that, but it's not going to. But at least if people move here, I can drive to Cary. I can go to Durham. It's all here, and that's the attitude you have to have, that you're all in this together. But you're right, it starts with the Metropolitan Planning Organization, it starts with your Council of Government, and everybody has to have skin in the game to make sure you succeed as a region. And I do know you have those regional entities already. The question is, how much strength support do all the electeds give them to be innovative, to go further, because we, this region, wants to be competitive. Wilmington did it. They were not the strongest, and now Wilmington shot out of a cannon, whether it's defense, tourism. It's amazing, since I moved to North Carolina in early 2000s, how Wilmington has transformed as a region. And that's from the last 10, 15, 20 years. So it can be done. Any more questions? 
Okay. okay. Well, I'm just I am excited for all of you. I was hoping I would be joining you at your inner city trip, but I am somewhere in this country. But I am uh, you're, you're going to be totally overwhelmed and excited by what you see. Once again, this is not pie in the sky. I did work in Raleigh, but I've been a consultant in many other places. This is a blueprint that we've used, and I can tell you that it works. Uh, and so I'm excited that you're embarking on this process. Uh, and so uh, I'll be here along the way advising. Uh, so again, it was a pleasure to meet all of you and to entertain your questions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Blackwell, you had a question for the manager? Yes. So and, and thank you, Mr. Silver, for the presentation. We appreciate it. Um, so, Mr. Manager, um, in times past, you know, when we talked about projects or consultants or process, we had conversation and discussion. Um, but that's changed. So what is our new process for selecting consultants? I think this is the first time I've heard that AECOM is um, leading our planning process. Were we going to ever meet with the company ourselves? Certainly, Council Member. So I don't believe that any processes have really changed. However, uh, this committee meeting was an opportunity for us to get a kickoff. And so that's what Mr. Silver uh, has done. Our staff has put together uh, to galvanize some excitement a launch for May. So we have not begun the public part of uh, any comprehensive planning process. In regards to how the consultant was co selected, uh, the council in the approved budget set aside a million dollars for us to endeavor these efforts. Uh, so the team uh, the, led by Ms. Pinkston uh, really put together a, did a lot of work to put together the data and analysis to uh, get a consultant that will come in under the budget that council provided. And so at a future meeting, uh, certainly, council will have the opportunity to interact with our planning team, who will be doing a significant component of the work, as well as the actual comprehensive planning consultant. But you've already initiated a process, correct? We've already selected a consultant. And a process is, I think, because I saw, isn't there a committee with people appointed on the committee? Right. Haven't you started recruiting? Every Everything that is underway is all a part of our agreement with AECOM. And so again, the public kickoff is scheduled for May. Okay. So we no longer need to approve contracts. We just approve the ability for you to contract in a budget and then you can make your own you make your own decision. No, sir. So I don't make my own decisions. The city follows public procurement for the state of North Carolina. So no no processes have been changed. Uh, we follow public procurement act. But we we've, we've committed to a com. I, I yes, guess I'm is, saying that is accurate. Okay. That that's what I'm saying. Normally I thought, at least in times past, we would have voted on a contract. We would have had a presentation about whatever the man just plan was and design a desire. Sure, as, and so as I stated, the council approved the budget and the city follows but the there has been no follow act. until this moment. There's been no discussion about AECOM with the city council. Right, so in my emails to council, we've provided updates on how we're tracking with this project as well as others. Also, at today's meeting, we have a capital project update. Yes. And so part of those updates are included within our capital improvement project update. So I think, uh, Councilman, to your point, today was supposed to be a session where we can uh, get some preliminary activities. For example, having uh, Mr. Silver come give a uh, preliminary what the benefits of comprehensive planning. We have uh, Mr. Hunter here to give an update about where we are in this current fiscal year in anticipation for our upcoming budget. So I think uh, you're correct. We are intending for this to be the venue where council can get this type of information. And is there a steering committee that will guide the planning process? There is a steering committee associated with the comprehensive plan. That is correct. However... And who was appointed to that and how did they get selected? Uh, I can send you those names. Uh, however, we want to make sure that we are clear that this is a uh, 12 to 18 month 
planning process with significant public engagement. And so what we want to make sure is that we do everything that we can to ensure that the public is attending all of these sessions and that we have significant public feedback. So this is not the type of endeavor that a group of uh, a steering committee or any one committee can put together. As Mr. Silver stated in his presentation, this is an extensive public engagement process. And what the results of that will obviously be zoning changes, policy updates, as well as capital improvement projects. But what we want the public to do is to be excited about imagining what Rocky Mount will look like over the next 25 years. You know, I appreciate the opportunity to have all of those major components intersect with each other. I appreciate the opportunity that we are bringing in um, skillful help to assist us in the design of the process. Um, I would appreciate that um, we're not the afterthought and come to discuss with after you've already designed everything and appointed folks. So, um, and I'm saying to you, then I, I want to make this clarity too. If you're sending emails, I'm not receiving them. You might be sending them to the public email, but I've noticed the last one that was forwarded to me had everybody others, everyone else's other emails, but mine is not included. So if I don't respond to something, it could be because I didn't receive it. So um, that would be helpful if it would go to what I asked it to be sent to. Okay, so um, that would be good. Uh, I am very concerned, however, uh, that uh, a million dollar contract, if it was that or whatever the amount was, because I don't know, you said it's less than a million, but we gave you a million, that we didn't have a chance to inspect it and review it prior to the signing of the document. And I would assume that that's something that is um, a process, that's a process in how you select your contractors. Absolutely, and right. council can certainly have uh, a copy of the contract. Uh, it was went under staff and legal review. So, again, we follow the public procurement process. It's not a intended to be um, anything other than just okay. getting getting the work done. Okay. Yes, sir. I'll just say this. I'll voice my opinion. I'm one of seven and one of eight when you include the mayor for major um, initiatives. Um, I would like input on the front side and not after the decision has been made, at least to verify, ratify, support, um, and comment and, and to complement the process. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that after the fact, okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Mr. Councilman? Uh, yes, even though it may be legal, I think we voted on at least a million dollars. Uh, but in the past, I think we have had RFQs to go out and that the council at least be abreast of uh, who um, we would like to do the comprehensive plan. And uh, also, um, I would like for each council person, also including the mayor, if we would have an appointment uh, to this uh, committee. Uh, we, we are part of seven boards. Uh, we don't know who has been selected, but I think every council member along with the mayor should have at least one person uh, from the ward uh, to be added to this committee that have already been selected. And also I've been seeing uh, Facebook posts and uh, articles in the newspaper in reference to the comprehensive plan and the process and then getting questions from constituents and not really being able to answer those questions. And so uh, I agree with Councilman Blackwell that we should be a part of that process. Um, just like the advisor put in five places of attraction, um, but did not include the event center. But if you go to the event center on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, <laughs> you see thousands and thousands of people. And it is an attraction that people are coming from all over the world uh, to our community. And so um, I just hope we just keep that in mind. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, also, I want to know how the council feels about that. 
that um, at least from our ward that we would have an appointment uh, on, on that steering committee. We need to look and see who owned it first. It might, it might already be some people. Up. Well, I'm just saying, we, what, I, we get too many. So it's already what, 12, 18. Well, I'd just like to know before anybody gets appointed. Anytime right. we spend a million dollars on a community wide process and we don't have any say so in who is representing our communities and our wards in addition to whatever, that's, that's problematic to me. I think it's uh, some confusion around what's actually happening. So what I can do is I understand council's uh, comments tonight about wanting to be involved in selecting a group to, to help uh, get us through this process. And uh, I see a lot of benefit in that. Again, today was an initial public step. So uh, none of those, that is still a possibility and something that we plan to present to the council as an opportunity going forward. Today, again, is a what I would consider a preliminary step in this conversation. So in regards to an, another committee, we will have staff present, bring that back to a committee as a whole for council to, to review those things and, and make those types of nominations. And can you define the difference between, what's the difference between an advisor and a consultant? So Mr. Uh, Silver, who is, I don't disagree with the thing he outlined, everything he said was real. I, I, I'm concerned about scope um, related to anti-displacement as Councilman Walker pointed out. But that being said, it's Raleigh. This is Rocky Mountain. So what's the difference between Mr. Silver Silver's activities in AECOM, and do they work together, or does one group work with you, another group work with the public and you and us? How does that work? AECOM is a the company, the firm. They are the technical technical consultants, so they will be put to putting together the technical document that will be the result of all of the public input and process that we take over the next 12 to 18 months. Who designs that process, the public input design process? We're not there just just yet, just okay. yet. So we will have a presentation on those specifics at a future committee of the whole. But from, be, from AECOM or Mr. Silver, or is that a group? It would be AECOM as well as our planning staff. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Silver is advising in his expertise on how to ensure that the city overall, because there are multiple benefits for doing such an endeavor, that we are doing everything that we can to maximize the process of undertaking comprehensive land use planning, planning for growth, and what the outcomes will need to be or the responsibilities will need to be from the city once we have the plan, what those ongoing commitments will need to be from the city. For example, funding for the capital improvement projects, requests that we make certain updates to the land use and zoning code, any policy guidelines that the council would need to take, such as anti-displacement. So not trying to get ahead of the, the public process, but that is what Mr. Silver in his experience and expertise will help us to do while the planning staff and AECOM focus on the technical documents. So he's looking for the holes, the places to shore it up. I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call them holes. I think it's more so looking like at the end of the day, what AECOM is going to deliver is a land use planning document. And so that might not mean a lot to everybody on the face. What Mr. Silver is helping us to do is what is in it for everybody. I'll, I'll say it that way. What are the benefits for everyone? And how does this connect to all the things that the city does? And who is inventory and how is that is with the public process document those conversations that are taking place in communities across the city? Is that what who who's documenting that? So while we're talking zoning regulations and you're also talking uh, possible arenas for growth. You still have to deal with community today issues and tomorrow issues as well, inviting new people. Is that Mr. Silver? Is that AECOM? Or do you have some other way of engaging that? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I follow what your question is. The Over the 18 months, we're going to be asking the residents what they want to see. Okay. The, the technical, and from that, then staff, city staff, and AECOM will put together technical solutions 
for what the community says that they want the city to look like, okay. then that would be for council to, to act on. So in regards to the meetings in the public realm, it is going to be forward looking. It is going to address present, future, potential issues, all of that. It will be an engagement process where we are and looking will, at all will we have a will we have a timeline so it's clear to us when we'll be meeting and talking about stages along the way yes so we'll so we'll be having these kinds of conversations throughout the 18 month period that's correct yes sir thank you councilman Harris yes uh, thank you mayor pro tem a couple of things uh, I would like to see the list of this committee if and I'm an advocate that we should have a representative from each ward on this committee. Second, are we, the council, is this presentation by the planning staff of AE going to be done in the month of April to us before the public kickoff in May? It'll be before the public kickoff, yes, sir. Councilman Knight, what is the, the cost of the advisor and the cost of AECOM? I know we allocated up to a million dollars. How much each? The cost for the AECOM contract is uh, 750000 The consultant is just an hourly rate. So I guess maybe to somewhat wrap this up so we can get on to the, to the next item. Um, Mr. Manager, I think the request has been, you know, to disclose who the steering committee is. Um, I think we'd like to see the RFQ slash contract, and then and then you've mentioned the cost, but maybe just put that in some sort of written form and send it out to the mayor and the council if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Does that sum up? Oh, well, we had many members. Well, I said steering committee. Yeah. I think most. I, I rather have what like define what. The, steering committee because it sounds like that's like staff yeah and if if we're asked for i get what councilman knight is asked for about having ward representatives but i don't i'm not sure if that's the same as this staff committee so i, I think if we can get that defined yeah, to, I'm, the, I'm with having the representatives right. i don't think it's the same as this right staff planning committee i agree with you but i just want to get it defined so we What's the difference in the two? That, I think, and, and, and if you, defi you define that when you send it out to us. Um, That's what I'm saying. When he sends it to define exactly what staff. Right. We can do it. Now. I think we're trying I mean, to get to the next. Sure. I'll I, 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 I do both. The, the steering committee, yes, is supposed to have a technical component to it. It is not just a citizens group that's why i said that will come later so uh your, your points are really right on time this was more of an introduction to the process so i'll send the contract which also talks about what role the steering committee out the easy one for example the chair of the planning commission is always a part of the steering committee for a conference and land use process so yes that is more of a technical versus a advisory group but there's room for both we'll send the contract and i think that co that'll cover um, everything and when you get the presentation from the staff and the consultant they will go into more details about the technical aspects of, of the plan and and to reinforce what councilman blackwell i think was asking but i don't know if we all understood but who who is going to when we have the public meetings i and, and correct me if i'm wrong councilman blackwell who is going to be documenting those meetings? So if we wanted to go back and look at the notes to make sure that, say, one that happened in, in Ward 2 was incorporated within the plan or Ward 5 or whatever it may be, it's just so we have, you know, we can document that and we can go back to our constituents and say, yes, what what was said in the meetings also were um, included within the plan. I think I think that's what Councilman Blackwell was asking for. Right. So. And, and all of that, everything that you all are saying, that is what the comprehensive planning process is. So that is required to be documented, and it is part of the final document. So that is the question of staff like, is that a staff or is that a is that a staff person or is staff that a, and consultant both? Uh, <laughs> so that's staff and consultant to answer okay. that question. All right. So if you if you don't mind sending that out within next week, it would be be great. And um, anything else before we move on to the next item on the agenda? Um, okay. 
So, I guess we're going to hand it straight over to Mr. Hunter. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hunter is going to give a council an update. Uh, what he's passing out now is we want a council to have a budget verse actual roughly as of where we are uh, at the end of February for the current fiscal year. Um, and Mr. Hunter's presentation is going to look at uh, the uh, I guess projections for the upcoming fiscal year and then following that we're going to ask Mr. Daniels to give everyone an update about our progress on our capital improvement program for the current fiscal year. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, this again is a revenue forecast report and it reflects where we think we're going to end the current fiscal year on June 30th and also where we anticipate revenues being for fiscal year 2025, which of course guides us in the development of our annual budget. So in terms of the current fiscal year, we are projecting when it comes to current revenues, and those would be taxes and fees, that we are projecting that we will be about $1.75 million above what we forecasted in our adopted for the general fund. Uh, that is primarily due uh, to growth in three areas or sustainability in three areas, but the biggest factor of growth that we have seen has been with Ad Valorum. And a lot of that is due to the fact that when we presented the budget to you um, for fiscal year 2024, we were working off the basis of a 94% collection rate. And at the end of fiscal year 2023, we actually achieved a 98% collection rate in the current year. And we anticipate that 98% collection rate holding for this fiscal year. So that has helped us generate about a million additional dollars in property tax revenue uh, that was higher than what we forecasted. So. Uh, we were, we were conservative and we have definitely improved significantly with respect to that source of revenue. Um, with respect to sales tax, we are on track. Uh, as of the end of February, we've received the first six of our 12 annual sales tax collections. And uh, the January collection is typically the largest one because it does reflect uh, retail activity in the spring, which we will receive in March. And so we are consistent with that. What we have noticed, and this should not be a surprise, is that there has been a slowing in the rate of growth. Um, we're, we're anticipating, and I'll talk about in the next slide, that obviously we will be more conservative with anticipated growth rates uh, with sales tax going into the future, and that is due to the variety of factors that shape the significant growth that we saw in sales tax for the last four or five years. With respect to investments, uh, as we have seen over the last several years, we have seen considerable growth in our investment of idle funds, and that growth is remaining consistent. The yields that we are receiving on our, on our investments, primarily through North Carolina Capital Management Trust, as well as through NC Class, are gonna generate about $500,000 more than what we, what we forecasted for the current fiscal year. We also wanna report that with respect to Powell Bill, we, of course, you received the annual Powell Bill allocation from the state of North Carolina. When we presented the budget for last year, North Carolina had yet to adopt its budget for the 24-25 biennium. And even when we adopted, they still hadn't. They didn't finish adoption until late summer. And when they did that, they did increase the allocation statewide for Powell Bill, which did result in a 7% increase above what we budgeted for fiscal year 24. It was about $122,000. We anticipate receiving about the same amount of money in fiscal year 25. Finally, with respect to our utility revenues, we have received improvement in our revenues, and also we've been able to maintain our margins, and primarily that's concerned with electric and gas operations. The revenues, for example, in gas have gone down a little bit, but our cost of purchase for gas has gone down more significantly. So we've actually seen our margin grow, and that's a reflection of the factors that we have to deal with with gas because the nature of commodity, its usage is heavily dependent upon weather, especially during the winter. There are certain factors we have to take into consideration when we're looking at it. So even if you look at it year to year, you may say, well, it's actually gone down. The reality is it's where it needs to be. It's showing with respect to sales and usage what we expected and what we forecasted for fiscal year 24. With respect to fiscal year 2025, we are in anticipating that compared to fiscal year 2024 and current revenues, right now we're anticipating that we will be able to book about, in our forecast, using responsible approaches, about $2.44 in additional revenue. 
And I will say that of that 2.44 million, about 1.7 million comes from property tax. It reflects our current estimation of the impact of revaluation. As everybody knows, we are current, Nash and Edgecombe County have completed uh, their revaluations for the current tax year, which applies to fiscal year 2025. Um, there are some significant increases on residential property. Nash County, is, when they provided us with their estimates for the city, was coming in at around 40%. We are still waiting for the final estimates from Edgecombe County, but we're anticipating about 30% at this point. That's kind of where we anticipate residential property to increase. Just for the sake, I did get my tax valuation report and it was significantly higher than, than both of those numbers. Um, we anticipate as a result of this information and incorporating all of the other ad valorem sources, which include commercial, personal, vehicles, and public service, we anticipate a revenue neutral rate of between 55 cents and 57 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. So that's what we've built this forecast on. We anticipate that with that rate and the revenues that we're going to that we're going to receive at that rate, we're anticipating a, that one cent of property tax will go from where it currently is at around four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars per cent to around five hundred and forty thousand dollars per cent. We also do recognize that our growth is slowing, as I mentioned before, in other current revenues. With respect to sales tax, we do not see it growing more than 3% in fiscal year 2025 compared to where we'll finish out fiscal year 2024. And also with respect to interest earnings, we of course have seen a significant increase in the yield. We're still performing well over 5% in the, in the, in the yield on our investments. We expect that that 5% will continue, but obviously that's going to reduce the rate of growth which is going to become more sustainable over that period of time. Uh, with respect, finally, in terms of utilities, I will simply say that, that we are looking to see uh, stability with respect to utility revenues. We've seen some growth in, in select utilities due to increased meter counts and customer usage, but we're anticipating those to, to remain pretty solid uh, in the coming year. So I'm, I'm happy to go over any questions that you may have with respect to this. Councilman Harris. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Mr. Hunter, help me to understand the word neutrality, neutral rate. Sure. Because the way I look at it, and I'm asking this for the benefit of all those who are looking into us, we got a major job ahead of us, pushing up our sleeves and, and, and document exactly what we want to assess our tax. But if I use 55 cents as a neutral rate, property taxes on my house is going up 30%. So explain to me neutral. Yes, sir. So when you are calculating the neutral rate, and this is the guidance that is provided by the local government commission, and it's been the same guidance that's been used now for uh, these last two, three cycles that we've had revaluation. The calculation is based on comparing, look at what revenue you anticipate to collect this current fiscal year. So we take the property tax revenue based on levy that we would collect in the current tax year. You then take the, reval the total value of all the property that you assess taxes on, which includes residential, commercial. Right. Now it's the residential that sees the most impact from the revaluation because it's the most the most number of properties that are being valued. Personal property is, is a little different. Vehicles obviously is different. Right. So you take all that money, you, you calculate the number, and it gives you a number if you're basically figuring out at what rate, based on the new value, you would collect that same amount of revenue. You are also allowed to include, and this rate does include this, you are also allowed to factor in annual growth because from year to year in your property valuation, there's been a small increase reflected to sales transactions or people buying new vehicles or, or development that is gradually increasing your, your taxes from year to year. So you incorporate that information. You, you, you figure out what that average was for all the years, the average of all the years growth on an annual basis prior to, up to the last revaluation. So we have six years because 
because we're having to do it in seven as opposed to normally we do it in eight. You take that average, you multiply the original revenue neutral by that, one, one plus the, the growth factor, and that gives you the revenue neutral rate. And you are correct because the revenue neutral rate, while it may generate the same level of revenue as you would have, it is going to do so in a way that is not necessarily going to be neutral for all of the individuals who pay the tax. For example, when we calculated this, one of the things that's going to happen when you reduce, when you, when you adjust the rate to revenue neutral, you're actually going to lose money from motor vehicle taxes. We have no way, because that, that number stays relatively static. So if you have a $25,000 car, you're likely going to see a little bit of depreciation from year to year, but you're actually going to be paying a low tax on it. So that tax bill does go down. Now, does that match? Does that make up for the increase on the residential side? Certainly not. That's, that's, that's just a difference. The idea with revaluation is to achieve what North Carolina's laws and constitution say in that all, all that the effort is to apply the tax rate as evenly and equally as possible across all properties and property owners that are impacted by the by the implementation of the tax. But that's a, a starting rate. Obviously, the council has the ultimate authority in setting the rate. Yes, sir. We are only required to publish that rate. Um, that rate does. That rate is the published rate. We're, we're required to provide that information to the public. The final rate, as adopted in the budget, is set by council as part of the budget process. Can you, as we look at the uh, budget for next year, give us various scenarios with tax rates of 48, 50, 52, 55? Let us see the impact of revenue. We certainly can. That is certainly something that we can look at when it comes to evaluating the impact when it comes to revenue from that source. Well, I'm concerned about a lot of people who rent and big increases in property taxes to those who own rental property. Those increased costs will be assessed to the renter. Sooner or later, the person, family renting that place is going to pay for it. So we got a, a, a major study that we need to do. Mr. Hunter, to piggyback on Councilman Harris, <clears throat> I think it would be prudent, well, I think we should ask Nash County and Edgecombe County to provide us a, a detailed breakdown Thank within you. the county, not only within the city of Rocky Mount, but whether it be Tarboro, whether it be Red Oak, whether it be Middlesex, whatever it may be, because I'm hearing within the city of Rocky Mount some astronomical increases of 100%, triple, and I'm just curious if the rest of the parts of the various counties are being impacted or is Rocky Mount and I also would like to have insight on how we're using the the, um, the comparable comparisons I would like to understand that more what what Nash County and Edgecombe County uses the comparable comparisons for for the real estate within the, within whether it's housing or whether it's uh, commercial because um, this is economic development and if, and if we have our rates go up too much it's going to impact like councilman harris said it's going to impact the renters it's also, also going to impact the people who were finally able to afford a home but now this may impact affordability uh, and then also our businesses that we need to help maintain it's a fine line i recognize that but i do have a concern that it's being the equ equity throughout the entire county whether it's nash or whether it's edgecombe and can so what is that can, can we formally ask that from them yes sir we can formally ask for additional information and we have been asking for information throughout this process uh, obviously and, and this is purely based off of what i've read in news reports that have been written by the telegram over the last couple of months both counties are are appear to be dealing with this issue and it's challenging for them as it is for us uh, both counties did use outside firms to do their assessments they did not do them in-house and uh, I think that was similar to what they did last time seven years ago. Um, we knew that 
that this assessment was going, I mean, based on what we saw in the real estate market and the fact that this was triggered by the fact that the sales to assessment ratio was out of balance in accordance with state law, this what triggered it a year earlier, we knew that, that the numbers were, were, were not necessarily going to be as pleasant for people to hear as they would like in most cases. There is certainly a need for more information and we can make those requests to the tax departments of both counties to obtain it so that we can find out more and have as much information as possible. And to your point, in the past, we have evaluated the impact, not just on the average resident, because we know that that average is a very, that average resident group is a very small group. We've looked at it across percentile within 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 property owners to really try to get an idea of you set the rate at what we say would be revenue neutral what percentage of residents are paying about the same what percentage are paying less what percentage are paying more in terms of property owners so there are many different ways that we can look at it and assess it and, and I think it's important that we for our citizens of Rocky Mount recognize that we just adopt the valuations provided to us by the counties and the, and the city of Rocky Mount um, does not go through and assess the properties. That's the county function. That is correct. It's, that's purely the function of, of counties here in North Carolina. We don't have any control of that. Uh, obviously, they're they're gearing up. Obviously, that they're going to be hearing a lot of appeals, and and that's been always the case with revaluation, and it certainly will be the case now. It's the same as the reports that we've received from Wake County and Wilson County because we're also in Wilson County cycle this year. So there's a lot that's to be expected. And. and I'll, I'll stop after this comment, but what concerns me is we have governments that, that pride themselves on not having tax increases over the years, um, but I think that, that based on this, this is going to be essentially a tax increase to the people um, who live in the, in the particular county. Yeah, or Edgecombe. Whatever county you live in. <laughs> Yes, sir. I guess this is probably not a question for Ms. Ryan, but more before I see the manager, uh, some of the programs that our counties are administrating for helping our citizens, and I've noticed that some of those programs that go to other municipalities, when it get to Rocky Mount, they don't assist our citizens, even though our citizens are paying those taxes that help them to generate that fund. And uh, especially with housing rehab and other things. And if we could, uh, I'll, I'll try to get a little bit more detail in that. But we could take a look into that. All right. Any more questions or comments with this presentation from Mr. Hunter? I just want a clarification. We're saying that both National County is anticipating a 40% increase in total uh, revenues from residential property in the county. And Edgecombe County is expected 30 percent. That is our guess right now with Edgecombe. Yes, We're right, still so waiting for additional information. Because my experience on the few things I own is closer to 100 percent. Yeah. Like I said, my 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 so, my bill. So if I do that math, that looks like what Councilman uh, Dalton is talking about. 100 percent is going to Rocky Mount. You divide that out, and it looks like we're bearing the burden. I know that's not true, but anyway. I hope it's not true. <laughs> it, I mean, it does get to the conversation that that, that I think Councilmember Daughtridge alludes. Alluded to in that there needs to be more information about right. the impact. Because that's right. Just need to understand. I can't that. guarantee. I can't guarantee anything. I just want to make sure I was understanding the slide. That's all. Thank you. Well, it's my understanding. Councilman Knight wants to know if we've got a time frame for you to get the information back. It's my understanding you've asked for the information. You're just waiting for the response. It's also my understanding, based on my letter that I received from Nash County, that you have up to April the 24th to appeal, which doesn't give you much time at all, less than a month. Um, so we, we need it ASAP. Yeah, we've, 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 we're, we're, like I said, we're, we're doing our best and we'll call them again tomorrow morning and say, we, here's based on the conversation we've had with you, um, that there are some additional requests for information that, that need to be made. Mm -hmm. Um, and then hopefully we can, to your point, be able to schedule something as quickly as possible um, if we can and, and try to do that uh, with respect to, as we go into budget, trying to, to have that information uh, to assist with the well, process. I would, I would say that the Sea Rock Mount, we have a lively public discussion. <laughs> yeah, we do. We, we, every, at every meeting, and I would encourage residents to attend the Nash County and Edgecombe County commissioners meetings to, uh, to um, 
do the same. Do the same that you do with us. Accountable. At least on that. Right. Hold them accountable. Yes, sir, Councilman Harris. Um, are we going to discuss this document and just hand it out to us? Uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer. Um, I, I certainly won't have time for Assistant Manager Elton Daniels to make his presentation, but I'll be brief. I promise. You know, <laughs> salaries and wages through eight months, 77.3%. How does that compare to budgeted numbers for the eight months? Yeah. I've been asking for actual and budget comparisons from the two Yes, sir. And, and it looks like to me we're way over budget. If I look just at the 77.3% for eight months, February, it should be 67 if you want to, you know, but I'm just, I'm dissatisfied in what we're given and not the extensive detail analysis that we used to be given. That's all. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. But before we move on, I wasn't aware. And, um, it was brought to my attention, but I didn't look at my phone. But we had uh, State Auditor Jessica Holmes was here, and I guess she, and I apologize about that. I, she what? She's still here. Okay. Well, we should have been introduced. She coming in after? Yeah. She coming in after you, right? Uh I'm not sure. She, 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 we can we can do this now, and we can take a pause. Or it's well, let's, take, let's go ahead, just because I'm sure she's got a busy schedule. Let's just have if if she's nearby. Yeah, right, come on. I'm sorry, I didn't realize she was here. I didn't either. But this is just on this not this yeah. Yes. Yes. Get over the state on. Accept my apology for for not recognizing you, State Auditor. And um, but please, please. Um, Are we go ahead? Going into? No, we're not going to close session. Were you coming here for close session? That is our understanding. Oh, I wasn't. Oh, we're in the last room. Okay. <laughs> okay. I will be very, very brief. If or manager, how do you want to proceed? Oh. Do you, you want to let, let let's let's let Elton finish? I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. I apologize. Sure, no problem. We can wait. Okay. I'll be very brief. I'm always teasing you, Mayor Pro Temp, about keeping us on time, and then the mayor for the regular meeting. I'm always getting on you, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take my own advice. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Just want to give you a quick overview of some of our CIP projects for the fiscal year 2024. And if you have in your document, you should have a two-page document that has the ones that I'll be mentioning on. If you have questions about others, feel free to let me know. First, uh, last year, you know, we were talking about dirt streets at our council retreat. I'm happy to report that we should have the ones that were listed uh, for this fiscal year, which are Coral, Emerald, Topaz, Louis Lane. They should all be finished in the next couple of weeks. I don't know if you've actually been out to the sites, but I have. Thank you. It's almost completed. You're welcome. I think the mayor, you were asking about Louis Lane as well, so we're getting those knocked, uh, knocked out the park. For transit vehicles, we are we are acquiring 13 new rural uh, paratransit vehicles. They should arrive uh, by the beginning of June. I'll just go off this screen. For water resources, we have rectangular clarifiers. Uh, I know that's. Uh, some technical jargon, but let me look at my sheet here. 
It's basically the electrical cables at the reservoir that kind of look like bungee cords that moves the uh, bridge going back and forth. They're over 40 years old and they're out there in the elements, so it's time to replace those. What else do we have? For fire, we have a sprinkler installation in all of our uh, fire stations except fire station two. And so that will be completed here in June. Uh, Self-contained breathing apparatuses. That's actually the oxygen packs that the firefighters wear when they go into uh, facilities. We had them all replaced. That was a $454,000 project that was finished in uh, February. Going back to water resources, we have the replacement of the gear gearbox for the screw pump. That was a $240,000 project, and that should be completed uh, in the next within the next couple of months at the end of May. Question? Yes, sir. I mean, I'll, I'm starting the presentation, but at some point, to the manager need to address us about fire station number two. Okay. What's the hold on? Okay. Other projects of uh, submission, we have the renovation of the senior center locker rooms. Basically, that's a complete renovation from all the lockers, as well as the flooring and uh, new paint on the walls on the inside. So that, uh, I know it's not just uh, used by the seniors, it's also used by uh, staff as well. That's why I go work out personally during the daytime. A lot of people uh, have been coming to me about using uh, those lockers and getting them changed out. So I'm happy to report that we should have that done pretty soon. The Lonious Monk Park, that park was not actually scheduled to be renovated. It actually was vandalized. So due to the vandalization, we decided to move that up uh, in the project. So that's actually already completed. So it has brand new equipment out there. That's, fin that's finished. Booker T Theater, that's one. Mr. Blackwell, I think you were mentioning a couple of uh, months ago. We're almost finished with the renovations for that as well. Sunset Park. We have not yet started on that, but I don't know if you recall, we received over a million dollars to renovate that park. That will replace the train, that will replace the carousel, and all the park equipment. Thank you. Mayor? Well, I was just saying, the Imperial Center, did you cover that? I did not. The Imperial Center is actually replacement of the roof. That's what we have programmed for uh, for that. And then there's some other repairs that need to be done, but starting just like when you're repairing a house, starting with the uh, most important first. Councilman Knight. And also about the sewer outfall. Is that in the. So that is not a completed project. We actually do have a sewer model. We have an outside firm doing conducting a study, doing a hydraulic model to pinpoint exactly where the issue is. Uh, so it would be a little premature to say how much funding and what the actual problem is because we actually haven't had the study complete. But it should be finished within the next two months. The study will. And then once they present us the results with the study, then we'll be able to address the problem. And that's something the council really needs to Right about like like yesterday. As soon as it's done, I'll be giving the report to the manager. We can go from there. Councilman Walker. Uh, now what about the BTW Community Center? I so, saw it was. I think we had a lot of like two point two point. $5 million. Yes, yeah, so what we were doing on that, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that for the week, this week on the 27th, that bid will be going out for the gymnasium. And so that project is to replace the first part of the project. Phase one is to replace the gym with a new roof, HVAC system, windows, a new entrance, and remodel restrooms because the restrooms are not working. So that uh, bid is actually going out on the 27th of this month. Okay. So is the gym open now? It's still open though, right? It's still open, but you know, it still doesn't have HVAC and stuff like that. And we actually have Porter John's put out there for the restrooms. So but about, that, about six month project. We will know once we get the bids back. The bids will be back hopefully on the 24th of April. Okay. And then we can decide from that. They'll give us a project timeline, estimated cost. But right. uh, the bid is going out this week. Thank you. Any more questions about projects that are on the screen or will we, will we be receiving a full document like this? What we had done before. It but if you well, that's the budget. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm asking will this yeah. come will this will come during the budget process. Is that Correct. Right? Okay. Yeah. I do have one question uh, about the downtown sewer major project. Have we heard from you? That's what he was talking about. So we're doing a hydraulic, a hydraulic model, and uh, we, once we get the results for that, we'll move forward. And the other thing I want to mention uh, during the other presentation, uh, 
the gentleman was talking about Wilmington, North Carolina. A lot of you know that's where I was born, raised in that area. Uh, and he talked about a lot of projects they did there. But I'd also like to talk about Rocky Mount because some of the things we're actually already doing. I've lived in Rocky Mount now for going on 10 years. Uh, when, in previous position and then now my current position for five years. And we have seven miles of greenway. We have uh, a robust park system. We have pickleball that we're currently uh, giving lessons and having games at the event center as well as building new parks uh, at Inglewood, which I think is in your ward. Mm -hmm. uh, we're building the pickleball park there. So a lot of the things that he talked about for placemaking, we're actually currently doing in Rocky Mount. So I didn't want that to be going unnoticed. And also, we're actually doing a comprehensive plan. Aside from the major comprehensive plan, we're actually doing a comprehensive plan within the Parks and Rec Department. And each, you were talking about wards, we'll have meetings in each one of your wards, and we're actually doing it in-house. Minus one person who just recently retired in December, so that's still considered uh, in-house. Ward six is tomorrow night. First one. Great. So I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. We appreciate you uh, being swift like you promised. Yep. Thank you. So my, my apologies on my, my mistake. But anyway, any other business, Mr. Man? Okay, with no other business, I think we're going to go into closed session for What's the purpose of the closed session. That's kind of what I'm looking at down here. Why are you looking at that? <laughs> Manager says economic development. Economic development. Do I hear about so you? Almost. 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 Almost.